Welcome. We're going to talk about Rails in an era of big tech. And first, I want to get started by talking about light bulbs. So I don't know if you know this, but in the early 1920s, light bulb engineers in Europe and the US made great technical advances. They could make light bulbs last over 2,500 hours. But the owners of these companies also noticed that as their technology improved and the lifespan of these light bulbs went up, their sales declined. They made less money, right? Uh, but wait, that's not how technology innovation is meant to work, is it? Shouldn't you make more money as you make more technical progress? Well, the owners of these companies didn't think that that should happen either, and they were just about to invent planned obsolescence. So what happened is that in 1925, they created the Phoebus Cartel. This was an organization of the top light bulb producers, and they would literally test the lifespan of light bulbs and would fine companies for outperforming a goal that they set of 1,000 hours per bulb. And as you can see, that's way below the average that they were achieving before then. So doing this, they doubled their sales. Great, right? Um, but how long do you think this cartel lasted? It lasted 14 years until 1939. Originally, they had plans to keep the cartel alive until 1955, but it wasn't until uh, because of the war, the, the collaboration fell apart. So right about now, you might be asking yourself, what, what has this got to do with Rails, right? Well, in her keynote, Eileen spoke about how much purpose she found in making the framework better and in giving to the community. This is because the core of the framework, uh, the core of Rails, is uh, enabling innovation and enabling the success of others. This is the opposite of the light bulb cartel. Rails is especially helpful for smaller companies getting off the ground and for developers getting their start in their career. The Rails community is in this way a benefit to society. Um, it organizes the industry, developers and companies to use the innovations to make uh, the world better. Unlike the light bulb cartel of the 20th century, we don't organize uh, to plan obsolescence and to sabotage our competitors. We're actually all sharing our knowledge and making each other more successful. But can the same be said of the big tech giants? You know, as consumers, we've been lulled uh, through their free use model, products like Google and Facebook. And as developers, we are on the receiving end of tech patterns that they popularize. In this talk, I wanna make you wary of these patterns and really drive uh, uh, a few arguments. Three main theses. The first one is that big tech architecture can jeopardize a lot of companies, most smaller, medium-sized companies. So that's the first one. And caveat to the, or a corollary to that is that the org tech fit really matters. So typically, we're looking at patterns based on how cool they are, based on uh, the computational elegant, let's say, elegance, let's say. But often, uh, cases that this isn't a good fit for our organization for various reasons. So I'm going to go into that. I'm also gonna talk about some novel dangers with big tech market power. You know, monop monopolies have been around for a couple hundred years, and there is an antitrust legacy in the United States uh, and in the rest of the world that has dealt with them. But recently, in, in the last 20 years, there's a different kind of, of, of uh, market power that uses uh, uh, cybernetics and uses uh, digital tools. I think that's something that uh, us in the industry, we need to be aware of because we're participating to some degree in it. Um, and lastly, the point that Rails patterns promote greater diversity because of how um, friendly they are to smaller companies and because they let teams that are smaller uh, compete uh, uh, in ways that would otherwise not be possible. So about me, I'm Jordan Trevino. You can call me Jordan as well. I'm the founder of Telos Labs and a Rails software developer. But I wasn't always a Rails developer. Previously, I was a strategy consultant, and I worked uh, for large pharmaceutical companies launching cancer therapies and the like. Uh, and that uh, taught me how to take a broader view than just technology. My work spanned business, uh, operations, and culture. And that's the kind of view that I uh, 
take today when we work with, with new clients. I'm also an enthusiast of democracy and organizational diversity broadly, as you'll be able to tell. Uh, I'm from Mexico, and Mexico is not a resource poor country, but it's, re you know, our results and the welfare of our population is relatively poor. Um, I think this has a lot to do with crony capitalism and too much market power, uh, which in, Me in the Mexican case is a legacy of colonialism. But I see more the U.S. at risk for turning into a country like Mexico than perhaps Mexico's transitioning to what the U.S. has been uh, uh, you know, throughout the years. So, yeah, and I'm a first-time RailsConf speaker. So, very excited. <laughs> So, talking a little bit more about diversity. Typically, we hear this more in the context of demographics, but I want to use the term a little bit more broadly. Um, I think diver diverse organizational structures really defend against autocratic power. They provide a choice for people, uh, employees, you know, you have more choices where to work, other firms with who you can collaborate with. And I think they preserve, um, this diversity preserves essential human values, traits, and attributes. Uh, the, the photo that you're looking at is, you know, a vibrant, lush ecosystem. And this is because in ecosystems, we know that diversity is a tremendous asset, that it helps uh, organisms survive. That monoculture, having one single crop, is actually the worst thing in terms of resilience when there are pests, when there's uh, ecological threats. So I think that diversity is very, very important uh, in terms of having these different approaches, um, and in terms of uh, allowing people to find the right company for them. I also want to mention that, you know, we are in an era that is facing tremendous challenges that include, you know, climate change or climate crisis, um, inequality, political polarization. These are all issues in the era of big tech. And it seems like they're getting worse because of business as, as usual. That business as usual doesn't have an answer to these challenges which could be catastrophic uh, for our society. So I think we need to nurture um, these different attributes that might not be so well cultivated uh, by big tech giants or by classic corporations that are, let's say, profit-seeking uh, all the time. So I think organizational alternatives include nonprofits, worker cooperatives, public utilities, community-funded orgs. Even in the digital space, a platform like Wikipedia, which is, has massive scale, uh, but the difference there is that the content isn't owned by the platform for monetization, which is, of course, very different from the big tech giants. So let's get underway with our journey. And first, I want to start talking about the decisions that we face on a day-to-day -day, uh, writing web software. So typically, when we start our career, we start on the right-hand side working on features. As we develop more experience and things get more complex, we progress to thinking about patterns. We might then start thinking about the stack composition. Um, do we use a single page app? How do we uh, really have a broader architecture view? And then eventually we think about our strategy for, for a larger company. Rails really spans all of these areas, clearly. But um, it's, it's also clear that there are other practices that are not, let's say, Rails first, that are very popular in the community. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, specifically you know, microservices and, uh, and single-page apps. So there's two approaches to these questions that we can talk about. There's computational thinking, um, which is what we're most comfortable at, uh, um, doing as developers. It's what's taught in computer science curriculums. It's really to focus narrowly on the task at hand. It's linear and reductive problem solving. And it works, right? You can solve problems in the context of a computer uh, using computational thinking. But what's the problem with that? Well, it's so limited and reductive. You don't, uh, you don't consider things that are outside of the perspective of that linear execution program. And therefore, it's really complemented by something called systems thinking. When you're using systems thinking, you're taking a more expansive, multidisciplinary approach. System thinking might include what you would do you know, if you get uh, a feature requirement and you realize that the customer's need might be served by just doing the product or, uh, or using a, a different feature or handling the, product, the, the customer's need in a completely different way. So systems thinking is key because if we don't have this, we can uh, fall victim to uh, uh, premature optimization or to uh, 
being captivated by computational elegance that might not be the right solution for our organization, for the product, um, or, or for any issue uh, broadly. So let's talk about tech patterns and the buzz around them and how we're related uh, in this community. So as developers, about two thirds um, uh, of developers work in small to mid tech companies. And of course we love Rails, it's really powerful in small to mid tech, even larger companies uh, like Shopify and GitHub. But then there's what I'm calling big tech, which is categorically different, which are mainly Google, Facebook, and so on. And these companies have a completely different scale. They have a completely different organizational character. However, because they're so powerful in society, because you know, they're at the tip of everyone's mind, they really get amplified in the tech media and they really get the opportunity to define a lot of the patterns that become popular also in our community as Rails developers. So of course, even though we might be using Rails, we're not gonna use Rails first patterns all the time. We might choose to do things differently that are popular in the community because that's what's trending and we think that there's something magical there that we need. So if we look at those patterns, this is um, a survey, uh, the Rails community survey results from 2022. We'll see that most uh, Rails developers are still working primarily in monoliths. And according to this, about a third um, are using some variant of either microservices or uh, service hybrids. And I just want to take a show of hands. Who here is working in either a microservice or a microservice hybrid kind of environment? So yeah, it looks to be maybe, maybe, maybe a third. Uh, single page apps, on the other hand, are much more popular. Um, I think perhaps it's controversial to bundle them into big tech patterns. Here, we can see that about maybe 40% of Rails projects, maybe half, are using some sort of single page uh, app front end. Uh, stimulus is actually pretty high up there. I was surprised by this, um, as well as Hotwire, which is growing. So again, it's a show of hands. Who here is using a single page app kind of front end in their main? Yeah, so maybe about half or 40%. So this seems to be accurate. So we've talked a little bit about some of the choices that are pretty common in terms of uh, what architecture you could use, how, uh, we might uh, change the Rails first patterns. Um, now let's talk about, from a systems view perspective, what are impacts that are affecting both our organization um, and, and the future success of our company um, that are outside of our control? Well, there's typically business constraints like budget and resourcing. Um, there's also external market constraints. Um, these mean, you know, how quickly do we need to develop uh, certain features? Do we have competitors that we need to uh, match? And none of these can we really control, right? That's outside of our domain as developers. But what we can control is the technology that we use in this environment. So I like to think of this metaphor of trying to reach escape velocity. You know, when you look at a rocket, um, the fuel is how much resourcing you have available. Um, the market constraints uh, are sort of how strong the force of gravity may be. And both of these things are, are things we don't control, but we do control our engine, what we assemble together as a technical team in order to give our company the best chance of success. So a lack of resources compared to need can sabotage our success. And you can influence how much resourcing need you will have based on the technology choices that you make. So let's talk about an abstraction. Here we can see on the left-hand side the amount of resourcing that your company is likely may need uh, or have available. So on the top a quadrant is high, on the low quadrant is low. And on the bottom axis, uh, we have the need for product development velocity. So what does it mean when you have a need for high product development velocity? It means that you're a startup. It means you need to get product market fit. It means that there's other competitors and you really need to innovate a lot of features. Companies that don't have a need for that might be a giant like Google, might be Twitter or Facebook. There are companies that are established that can have a more static uh, uh, kind of uh, product velocity. So what I wanna show here is that, and of course this is controversial, this is my opinion, and we can have a discussion about it, but that the big tech patterns on any given level of product development velocity will just require higher, higher level of resourcing, right? 
they uh, require more people, they require more skill sets, more servers, more skilled DevOps people, um, functionally split development groups, whether it's front end or back end and so on. Um, Rails, on the other hand, needs less over, uh, overall resourcing. That's the main uh, advantage of the framework. And this includes, you know, this included in its doctrine with uh, convention over configuration, but also in the patterns that it adopts with an integrated uh, sort of front end and a monolithic approach. So over the course of this presentation, I will show some arguments uh, around why single page app approaches and microservices, we can look at them as big tech patterns and how they might not be as useful um, as you might think if you're reading you know, just the, the, the tech news and you see a lot of coverage around how these planners are so excited. So what happens if your re, uh, organization experiences a new resource constraint? Let's say your organization is using big tech, big tech patterns and a resource constraint, something that you couldn't predict, something changes, valuations change, ability to raise funding changes, so you have now this yellow line that is this resource constraint. What this looks like is that if your organization needs a level of development velocity um, that is beyond what you're now able to produce here, you're essentially not gonna be able to compete. You're not gonna be able to do what's needed. It's what we might call the death zone, right? It's, it's, it's an area where your organization needs something out of your technology that you're no longer able to provide. So this is what it looks like from a big tech perspective. How is this different from a Rails-based uh, company? Well, of course, this depends on us believing that these lines are different and that there is a lower level of resourcing. But if there is a lower level of resourcing that is needed on these Rails-first patterns, as I believe it is, then very clearly, on the same constraint, you're able to do a lot more velocity and the space, the death zone shrinks. It means that you put your company in a better position to succeed, right? But how often do you consider these dynamics like resourcing, or whether market conditions are gonna change, whether the valuations are gonna go down, whether new competitors are gonna enter when you are influencing the tech decisions that are made in your company. I mean, typically this is outside of the domain of developers because we are in our computational thinking mindset. So I'm making the case for how Rails already is thinking about that and that we are benefited when we include uh, um, these considerations. So now let's look at a case study. So at Telos Labs, we recently had a client which had uh, built its product uh, with a Rails backend and a single page app front end. Um, this company had raised hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, it had uh, uh, you know, about 500 employees, technology team of you know, around 50 to 75 and so on. And after about six years, their tech team had just gone disappointed with their stack. They had problems on their monolith that they felt they couldn't really solve or didn't want to solve. There had been a lot of team turnover, and this coincided with the era of the popularization of single page apps, of the idea of JavaScript everywhere. So naturally, the team started thinking that the solution to their problems was migrating away from Rails and actually embracing an entirely different pattern. So they decided to move to a microservices uh, architecture. This is what it ended up looking like. So, um, in retrospect, I think we can say that this was a, you know, what's called a distributed ball of mud. You had the Rails API on the left-hand side there. Uh, you had a single page app up top, and they'd created a Node API and almost close to 20 microservices that were running on Node. That single page app was over 300,000 lines of code. Uh, because it needed to connect to all these different services, but all this data was needed on different uh, uh, on the same page, essentially, they had a lot of duplicative data transformation logic across that single page app. And there was a lot of interdependency, uh, uh, therefore, among the services. And it didn't work out for them. The problem that they had was that they were experiencing very, very slow development times. Timelines were completely unpredictable. They just didn't feel like they could estimate a feature. Um, and they would get estimates from the development team and it would take three times longer. They had reliability issues because they had a much more complex DevOps situation. You know, think about 20 microservices and having to maintain that across three environments and the deployment situations and so on. Every outage is like a murder mystery. You're trying to find out what went wrong and which service is, 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 is the result. So if we take a look from a systems thinking perspective, you know, the experts for Micro, for microservices had left, and the company continued to, to need significant product enhancements merely to enable adequate growth. This wasn't a company that had a stable product at all. They, their cash burn was very, very high, and they would run out of cash. Uh, 
And the company's customer base was actually enterprise kind of customers. They had users in the order of thousands. They were never going to get millions and millions of users. So why was this pattern really chosen, right? So our client wanted to accelerate development velocity. They wanted us to deliver a way, both a new process for making product development so that they could estimate correctly, but also we were tasked in uh, delivering an important new feature that was essentially new, new reporting capabilities uh, in under six months. So it was both how can we change the way we work and is there a silver bullet to this and you must deliver or we want you to deliver these, uh, this important new, new feature set. So definitely a um, complicated situation and um, a difficult one. So what to do, firstly, massive learning situation. It's very important to deep dive, obviously, on the technology, on, on the code audits, on uh, all the apps, understand their process, um, and understand the requirements of this new feature set. And then also to engage with the team and leaders and really put the system uh, perspective together. So when um, uh, looking into this, it was clear that our team was not going to be able to deliver the new functionality with the existing patterns. It was just gonna be way too complicated. The experts who had built them had already left. We didn't have experts who could really guide us to a very complicated domain. Um, so it was clear to me that we needed to transform the way of work of this organization. So the two main areas to think about is how to handle this complex single page app. These pa this pattern that had been with the company from day one. Um, and really there's, there were two that they were thinking about. One is business as usual, or two, change to a newer framework. Maybe the, 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 the problem was that this is just not the right single page app framework. Maybe going to Next.js or, 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 or something else was going to solve the issue. Um, secondly, it's how to handle that data layer. So again, business as usual, or overhaul the node services, which was not our expertise. Or maybe what our client most likely thought we were going to do is create a new rail service that just handled this new reporting capability. And meanwhile, they had other teams involved. They had other teams trying to overhaul the node services. They knew that they were in a sort of crisis situation and they wanted to keep their options open. So if we look at it from our diagram again, what had changed was that, you know, that green dot on the big tech pattern was maybe where this company was performing. It had a certain level of high resources. It had a certain level of relatively low product development velocity. And now they realized that they needed much higher product development velocity in order to keep up with their clients. Uh, so they had a velocity target and that now they had a lower resourcing constraint because a lot of people had turned over and they were gonna have less cash on hand. So I look at this and I, thought the only way to make it work is really to move, jump over from that blue line and get over to the red line. If we could do this for this client, it would be a massive success because then they could actually have a chance of success with higher velocity at lower cost. This is the amazing power of Rails. Not only can it uh, perform more cheaply than big tech patterns, but it can deliver much uh, greater product velocity for the same resourcing. At least that's what I believed at the time. So two recommendations that we came up with. One was shift to the server uh, rendered front end, and two was to restore the monolith, which both of these were quite controversial from the perspective of our client. And actually the most controversial piece was um, shifting over to a server side rendered front end. Um, this diagram here is from S uh, Sam Stevenson, RailsConf presentation from 2016. Um, and really what it encapsulates is on the left-hand side, you can see the complexity of a very basic kind of single-page app setup. This doesn't even cover the virtual DOM, but it just shows how you essentially have two applications. You're loading, uh, you have an HTML boot page that loads JavaScript that then makes requests to a JSON API and then renders uh, the view on, 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 um, on your front end. The multi-page app or ser server-side rendered pattern is a lot simpler, of course. You, know, you, you have a very HTML page that renders on your first load, and then you make requests and you get the new content. So I was a big advocate of this, but it, it was very controversial. I thought that this was gonna lead to simpler execution flows, it was easier to follow, that it would be easier for this company to move over to full stack patterns rather than having separate development teams, which again reduces the cost and, and resources, that it would eliminate front end state concerns, and that it would dry up that data transformation logic on the front end, which was very duplicative. But of course the question was, can this really perform when this client had expectations of a completely dynamic front end. 
I believed it could, and at the time, um, we thought TurboLinks was the approach. Well, actually, Turbo, but Turbo wasn't supported by, uh, didn't have Internet Explorer support, and this client needed Internet Explorer support, so, so TurboLinks was the answer there. So how to show the new content rendered from this monolith when you have a very complex single-page uh, application and you have issues like authentication, data that needs to be scoped. So believe it or not, this is not elegant, but the, the actual solution that, that ended up working and still working to this day is to iframe the new server-side rendered front end into the single-page app. So what you can see in the diagram on the right-hand side, the green areas, let's say, are the single-page app frame. You would click on the link for the new feature, and this red content would just render a classic, more conventional Rails-based approach you know, that was uh, uh, working in 20, well, since TurboLinks, right? And of course, this content would have the feel of a single-page application, because that's what TurboLinks and now Turbo does. Um, and we would be able to uh, um, actually scope to the user by passing certain ID token on the iframe URL as a query param and then authenticating the user um, uh, on the rail side. So of course, authentication was, was a challenge. There are also some situations where you need the iframed app to communicate to the single page app. You know, sometimes you have some modal that up, opens up in the single page app, you have drop downs, you have things that you need to close. So there are ways to solve that. Uh, you can use post message, we use a library called PenPal in order to configure how you send messages from, from one environment to the other. And this ended up working. The other technical challenge is how to create the new functionality in record time from a new monolith when this new feature, remember, was reporting, so you needed to access all the data, basically, depended on connecting to more than 12 services. Um, so if we, if we compare side by side the um, different patterns, on the left-hand side you have a monolith, classic monolith that has one database, and you have all your tables there. On the right-hand side you have this new microservices pattern that this company had adopted. So basically you had your single page app and a node API layer, and then beneath that you have close to 20 services, each one with its own database and tables in, the, in that database. So our options we thought at the time were, one, either to connect to the API layer uh, and query the data and reconstruct you know, the new presentation logic in the monolith, or somehow to bypass the API layer, even though that's precisely breaking the pattern of microservices and, and, and producing that uh, uh, a API layer. But of course, if we went the first option and connected to the API layer, then really our Rails monolith wouldn't really work as a classic Rails monolith. We'd end up having to connect to all these services, transform data on the Rails monolith, and essentially we'd just be adopting a lot of the responsibilities of the single page app, but we wouldn't have a lot of the benefits that a typical Rails application with its active record access has. Wouldn't it be great if we just could consolidate all these microservices into a, a, a monolith? Well, this, of course, could never work because we were pr uh, creating a new feature, but we weren't going to replace the entire application, which was quite big, and still needed to work and depended on all these microservices. So we couldn't do a massive data migration of all the databases into one database. We couldn't consolidate this into one single app, not in, not in the time that we had available, the resources that we had available. So. The solution was uh, connecting to multiple databases, right? restoring a classic Rails monolith, bypassing the APIs, um, and therefore having, again, the power of active record. And you know, yesterday, Guillermo gave a, a great talk about how you, know, you could use a microservice environment in a Rails approach, even with multiple databases, and do event kind of driven architecture. But we thought that this wasn't what we wanted to do because that would still maintain a lot of complexity. This company wasn't really using event-driven architecture. So what we wanted to do was really get the power of active record directly and handle the complexities of multiple databases within a standard, classic, kind of uh, Rails logic flow. So um, the other important element of this is when you're recreating a Rails monolith from an existing set of uh, you know, complex microservices and uh, databases, you have an opportunity to create a domain-driven design within the Rails new monolith. You know, in microservices, you, you fragment everything, but in a context where this company had had a lot of product evolution, these microservices had bizarre names that didn't relate to their use on the front end or to the, to the, to the user. So you had a very bizarre 
uh, it, it made it difficult to reason about their, their application when things weren't named in a way that made sense and there wasn't uh, easy concepts to grasp. But with a Rails approach, being able to create the models as if you were creating novels from, uh, you know, from scratch, but actually connecting to the specific database um, and maybe even changing the name to make it more semantically meaningful, this gave us a way to reason about the application not only for this feature, which was a reporting feature, but as a new pattern for new feature development for this company as a whole. So again, this is how you do multiple databases. You just have in your database YAML, you connect to each uh, database. Um, and there's some gotchas where on the front end, oh, sorry, not on the front end, on your, on, in your model, you have to use an abstract class. You have to, uh, um, if you have certain uh, concrete classes that depend on uh, or that connect to that specific database, they should inherit from an abstract class that actually handles a connection to the database. Otherwise, you might create too many connections to the database. So this is in the Rails guide. And so what, was it, what were the results? Well, Rails made a comeback. Uh, we were able to pull this off. Uh, we were able to recreate a monolith that was basically turbo links and stimulus. Uh, it was the server-side rendered front end. And not only that, this new pattern made it a lot easier for this company to uh, stand up Rails teams in parallel um, and to deliver uh, um, all the functionality uh, and velocity that they needed. Eventually, the company IPO'd. So what are the major operational benefits to integrated patterns? Being able to do full stack development, right? Uh, when you adopt a single page uh, a pattern, it's very common to really have to uh, uh, break up the teams. And again, this, is, this adds communication issues, that's at, this adds complexity, that adds more people. So really full stack development simplifies that. Dry data transformation, you, you get all that benefit in the monolith and we really were able to see that in this case by having all your domain easily available through active record even though underneath you had these multiple databases. Uh, not have to worry about these front end state concerns and at the same time provide the snappy experience that this, uh, the, the, the users wanted and this ability to really lean into a strong domain that is easier to reason about application development. So now I want to talk about a little bit, you know, let's unpack this big tech issue a little bit more. Um, and I want to make clear that when I'm talking about big tech here, the, level, the scale difference when you look at a Google or a Meta, and this is a chart that shows the lifetime company profits, again, you know, compared to even a very large Rails, uh, uh, user like Shopify, it's a completely different, uh, I mean, this is two order of magnitudes different uh, uh, approximately. Um, these are much larger companies. There's nothing really in the Rails ecosystem that, that, that is really to that, si uh, 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 to that scale. And I think this difference in scale also betrays a difference in character. So big tech is so large with billions of users, with hundreds of thousands to millions of employees. Amazon has 1.6 million employees. Hundreds of billions of cash on hand uh, I believe Apple has over 200 billion, that financial resources are no longer a constraint to these companies. Uh, what is a constraint? Well, hiring, um, regulations in, in many instances, internal communication and management challenges, because it's very hard to work with hundreds of thousands of people, um, and even economic conditions or world limits. You know, when you're at the level of Google or, or, or Facebook, then the world population you know, starts hindering your growth. Uh, so internal integration just isn't feasible for these companies. Uh, so they have to create a different way of working. They have to uh, uh, really segment their teams into front end and back end. They have the resources to really stand up uh, DevOps teams and produce all these tools that make their way of work possible. But often in our world, we look at these companies and we think that because they're using these patterns, I mean, they must be successful uh, their success must be attributable to their use of these patterns, right? So maybe if we use microservices, maybe if we use single page apps, our companies are gonna succeed, right? So this is exactly the opposite of the argument I laid earlier where this resourcing constraint was actually gonna risk or jeopardize the success of this company. And effectively, you can see, if you look at Google, you look at their growth, microservices was created as a word in 2011. They were already at 40 billion in, 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 in revenue. Uh, first release of Angular, you know, they were again, and this has nothing to do with their technology uh, approaches. They've created uh, their technology approaches as a consequence that financial limits are no, no longer a, resources, uh, a resource constraint. So meanwhile, majority of Rails developers work in small to medium tech, you know, typically less than 50 other developers. Uh, 
Um, and even large rails companies are far short of 100,000 employees. So our community is very, very different from that. I also want to mention that you know, market power has been around for a long time. You, know, you had a monopoly with US oil. You had um, AT&T that was broken up. You had railroad uh, uh, trusts that were broken up. And typical market power means that you determine prices. You have power over suppliers and employees. And so you are able to gen generate more profits for yourself. And the danger there is maybe reduced innovation and so on. But this is something new. It's new to these massive digital platforms, and that is the power over perception itself. You know, when you look at uh, a social media uh, giant, you can't guarantee that the content you're looking at uh, is the same as someone else. It's in fact clearly not. Um, and their technology is really geared at behavior modification. That's the core of what it does. It, it does behavior modification for um, ad sales, right, to, to, to generate ad revenue, but this can also be used for political control. It can be used for economic domination when you, know, you, you don't show the same products or the same prices. And there are unprecedented dangers to this. I'm gonna just throw a few words here. We're not gonna unpack it, but uh, there's a the concept of techno-feudalism, which basically is a post-capitalist situation where really um, you know, the product is free the same way that serfs could freely live uh, uh, you know, on, on the Lord's land, um, but really everything is owned and you have to uh, uh, work for free, essentially. So when we look at a product like um, Google or Facebook, any content that you generate on those platforms are appropriated by them for their benefit. And this requires some novel legal kind of acceptance of that, and it's not without controversy, but in fact, that's what's required. Where's that leading? That's an important question. And the other perhaps very important danger, cybernetic authoritarianism. So these companies have a lot to lose if there's antitrust, if there's political concern around the, their power. They have a tremendous amount of power. So why wouldn't they just get closer with a, an authoritarian government and so on to suppress any sort of threat to their power in this way and also perhaps support uh, uh, politicians that are friendly to them? Of course, the US has a long history of antitrust um, that has really forged great standard of living in this country. And, you know, it goes back to the 1890s, 1914, and so on. There's a lot of histories uh, uh, of, of breakups, and there's heroes in this, in, in this fight. So this isn't a novel thing. However, antitrust enforcement has radically been reduced in the last 40 years for a variety of reasons, but it's generally a concerted uh, effort to weaken the antitrust regime. Generally, let's just gonna summarize this to neoliberal ideas and ideas that it's okay for monopolies to exist so long as the products are free. Um, and it also has led to a lack of uh, um, reviewing mergers and acquisitions. And so what we see is that these tech giants, you know, the gray, these are the number of acquisitions. The gray are acquisitions in their sectors. The blue is acquisition in new sectors. And what they're doing is essentially using their profits from their source of market power, whether it's dominating ad sales or whatever, and reinvesting to get into new areas of the market. This typically starts with offering a product for free, you know, like Google Slides could be free and so on. But what it does is it kills startups. It, it, it creates new death zones for small companies and medium-sized companies because you can no longer try to produce that product and offer, and, uh, offer it for a price that you need to survive, right? Meanwhile, they're doing this to grow their power. And, you know, talking about TikTok, um, you might have heard how, you know, there's questions about TikTok because it's, you know, related to China and so on, but it's also the case that TikTok is an extremely good competitor in the social media space and is growing the fastest in that in the U.S. And that Meta, you know, was behind organizing uh, um, a, a push to get TikTok banned. So these companies are really exercising a lot of power and they're you know, exploiting some misinformation and, and, and lobbying campaigns. So the tide may be turning, who knows, but uh, Lena Khan, who is the new FTC chairwoman uh, as of this administration, has championed some writing and some new thinking, criticizing uh, uh, essentially the precedent of the last 40 years that have enabled these companies to get so, so massive. And we do see now some significant lawsuits um, against these companies. So you see the Justice Department suing Google for monopolizing digital advertising. Meta is under a similar lawsuit. 
Apple now has to allow different app stores or has agreed to allow a different app store in Europe because it's under pressure, as well as app side loading. However, that's probably not coming to the US because they're not under the same pressure in the US. So uh, these things are happening. So I don't want to, you can't see the screen? Okay. Uh, well, let's continue because it's okay. So this was all about making um, you aware that big tech pattern, well, that monopoly is a danger, it's a new danger, and so on. Let me just close out by saying that big tech patterns may not be right for you, right? That um, these tools are, are meant for a different scale of company. Uh, in many cases, that doesn't mean that you can't use single-page app or services. Of course, we're doing that all the time, but probably leaning into Rails-first practices is a good idea as a default. Um, and it's very important to understand your organization. It's very important to put your organization uh, in a position to be able to succeed, and therefore finding org tech fit, basically mapping the tech architecture that you pick to the needs of your organization will be something that you in your role as developers, whether you're starting in your career, whether you're progressing to leading teams or to leading a technology group, um, that will be very helpful for your company. And it's a better way of driving technology decisions than narrowly focusing on computational thinking and the tech buzz, whether it's microservices, whether it's virtual DOM, and that kind of thinking, we sometimes often think that it's the solution and that's the answer to our, to our needs, but actually you'll get a lot more benefit by thinking about other uh, uh, dynamic elements of, of the system that you're operating in. So Rails is awesome because it helps us succeed, and thank you for making uh, the Rails community awesome.